Welcome everyone to Bitcoin Tina on Bitcoin, presented by Bitcoin Magazine. I'm Christian, one of the editors of the Bitcoin Magazine podcast. You may know me from Twitter as at CK Snarks. To me, Bitcoin Tina is an incredibly high signal individual because he comes from a different time than the average Bitcoin enthusiast. Most Bitcoiners are millennials with fresh scars from the 2008 global financial crisis or digitally native Zoomers who barely know a world without Bitcoin. Unlike most of us, Bitcoin Tina is a boomer and he is old enough to have experienced the craziness of the dot-com bubble and he's old enough to have had money in order to trade that craziness. Yet, despite this, and unlike most boomers, Bitcoin Tina is deeply knowledgeable about Bitcoin and is a Bitcoin community member. I asked Bitcoin Tina to create this four-part series with me in order to help distill his mental models and to attempt to better explain how he sees this whole Bitcoin thing shaking out. We break it down into a four-part series. The first is understanding how the world and technology evolves. Next, how to value Bitcoin and store of value. Third, how to think about investing in Bitcoin. And finally, part four, the path to 100 trillion USD. Believe me, this four-part series is incredibly bullish. But before we get into it, I want to tell you a little bit about Bitcoin 2020 Conference. Bitcoin 2020, like this podcast, is presented by Bitcoin Magazine. And the team there has been working hard to create an event that Bitcoiners deserve. I'm telling you guys, it's going to be crazy. Bitcoin 2019 was crazy and incredible. And many Bitcoiners left telling me that it was the best Bitcoin event of the year. It's going to be like a Bitcoin Twitter in real life. And Bitcoin 2020 is going to be twice as big as Bitcoin 2019. The festivities are going to be going on all week, the last week of March. It's going to be a Bitcoin week in San Francisco. I believe the first event is on the 24th. But the official conference is not until Friday, March 27th, and the second day, Saturday, March 28th. I can't wait to see you all there. For those of you who have not bought your ticket yet, you can use code CK for a 20% discount when you check out with Eventbrite, or you can pay in Bitcoin where you'll always get $50 off your purchase. Like I said, hope to see you at Bitcoin 2020. But until then, please enjoy Bitcoin Tina on Bitcoin, part one. I am extremely excited to bring you the first installation of Bitcoin Tina on Bitcoin. Tina and I have been working tirelessly for the past couple of weeks trying to really perfect and distill his amazing and, in my opinion, accurate mental model of looking at Bitcoin. And the goal of this podcast, like I said in the intro, is to really try to explain what we think is happening and really go over how Bitcoin Tina is looking at this Bitcoin phenomenon. And without further ado, let's just get right into it. Welcome to the show, Bitcoin Tina, and thank you for working with me on this special series. Christian, thank you so much. It's really great to be able to do this with you. That's quite a build up. And I, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> not sure that I can live up to the expectation that you now set. You just put a very high bar for me. And I will do my best. I occasionally ramble some, and uh, I appreciate people kind of bearing with that. I, I, try to th- I, I tend to think in terms of uh, examples of things, and so that's, that tends to be how I talk and how I, I refer to things. I personally find it extremely helpful the way that you kind of frame things. Uh, so, you know, without further ado, let's just, let's just kind of get into this. Something that we've talked about a lot is we've both made this observation that we are living in a world in transition. And I like to call it hyper-Bitcoinization. I, I know you agree with that as well. Do you, do you just want to get right into, into what this kind of looks like to you? Absolutely. I, I agree with Christian. I think that uh, we are actually living in hyper-Bitcoinization. Broadly speaking, I think of it as a process which is basically repricing the world in Bitcoin, as um, bold as that might sound to people. I like to tell my daughter, pay attention. It's amazing what you can learn. And I I try to look at Bitcoin from the perspective of my life. I 
started using computers back in the early 80s. And my perspective on Bitcoin is very much shaped by my own personal experience with that. When I start looking at Bitcoin, I think as a base case, and we'll get into the qualities of money later and the qualities of Bitcoin and, and, and what that represents. But as a base case, I think Bitcoin is actually much better than gold as simply as a store of value, simply as something that one might want to hold on to. And so if I take gold and I make the not very radical assumption that there's a substantial number of people in the world who like holding gold. And if I look at the gold market and I recognize the gold market is in the neighborhood of nine to $10 trillion, I think it's a reasonable proposition that Bitcoin could easily at least equal the value of gold. Now, I know many gold guys out there and gold women will say, oh my God, that's crazy. How could that possibly be? How could gold equal Bitcoin? I mean, that's just insane. I was watching an old clip of Arthur C. Clarke yesterday, the day before. And this was actually pretty interesting. This was the year 1974. And uh, absolutely amazing clip too. He was talking to a journalist and his journalist's son was sitting there. His son was probably somewhere like eight years old, nine years old, 10 years old. And Arthur C. Clarke, now you got to think back to 1974. 1974, there pretty much wasn't really such a thing as personal computers. I remember 1974. And Arthur C. Clarke was saying things that really we would actually consider quite remarkable because he was arguing that computers will be these small things that everyone will have, be able to do things from your home and, and, and talk about things you might be able to do with your computer. Now, he wasn't perfect on this expectation, but bear in mind, back in 1974, you were looking at mainframes, these very large computers with reel-to-reel -reel tape, and the idea that you might have your own computer that you use yourself, it's a very strange idea. Now, I'm not sure that he got it completely correct. He might've said, you're gonna, have, you're gonna have a device that talks to the computer, but that's all right. His understanding of where things might be going was extremely advanced for the time. And that I think is important. I have something that I keep saying over and over again, and that it's the idea that people have a very hard time imagining a world that they are not currently in. They have a very hard time imagining that the world of the future is going to be different from the world they know. And it's actually pretty interesting. I look back myself on, on my growing up, and I'm in my late 50s, and I see lots of things that could very much be perceived as very much the same in some respects although they're things which are very much different, have changed quite a bit. It, it, it's hard for me to see through the eyes of somebody who is less than half my age. Things that I might see look similar, they might, um, they might not quite see that the same way, but there are definitely a lot of similarities. And there's some things which take quite a long while to change. It's very hard for most of us to picture the impact of things that we are seeing now. And so often when it comes to new technologies, there's so much skepticism that we dismiss them. We write them off as being bubbles or Ponzi schemes. And, and, and that's sometimes a very, very big mistake. Gold has a market cap in the neighborhood of nine to $10 trillion. Maybe it's $8 trillion. And if we, if we look at that priced in Bitcoin, the maximum number of Bitcoin outstanding, that would be equal in price to Bitcoin between four and $500,000 of Bitcoin. And I think it's actually quite reasonable to assume that Bitcoin could easily be between four and $500,000 10 years out, which means that from a compounded annual return basis, we're talking about potentially a 44 to 47% compounded annual return from between 40 and 50 times the kind of increase that you might get over a decade. Now, I actually think that's excessively conservative because I think this is a whole lot bigger than that. We've seen technologies replace other things very, very fast. The critique that I hear from people when I tell them that Bitcoin could at least be equal to gold. Now, actually, I think Bitcoin could be more like minimum three to four X gold, possibly more because of its qualities being so much better than that of gold as a money or as a store of value. And, and people immediately dismiss the idea. They'll say, there's a term Lindy, which basically means that something's been around a really long time and, and, and people have become used to it. And because it's been around a long time, it means it's going to be around a lot longer. And Lindy is absolutely an important effect. I and mean, we, we talk about Bitcoin as being Lindy. If something were to be 10x better than Bitcoin, one might argue that that could replace Bitcoin. One of the nice, on, on a tangential note, one of the things that Adam Back had commented on is that we could take the UTXO set, 
which is basically what everybody's position is in Bitcoin, and basically put that into a new technology. So Lindy becomes much less of an issue with Bitcoin than it would be with other things. But if, if you look at things that change rapidly, in the early 1900s, everybody used horses. I've seen pictures of uh, New York's Fifth Avenue, where in one year, in the early 1900s, you had pretty much everything was a horse or a horse and wagon or carriage. And not that many years later, maybe a decade, it was mostly cars with um, very few horses. We've seen in the course of my life, typewriters and, and how those pretty much went away with computers. And that happened reasonably fast. I remember, by the way, as a brief aside, when uh, some stockbroker cold called me to try to sell me an IPO. You know, when you, when you get a call from a broker who you've never heard from before and they try to sell you an IPO, that means that nobody else wants to buy it. So it, it's, it's actually generally something you don't want to buy. But uh, this was Smith Corona typewriter. And I, I remember sometime in the late 80s, maybe 88 or 89, could have been 90. I, I don't remember exactly. The thing was priced at 20 and I don't think it even traded there on its first trade and it, it never ticked up, pretty much never ticked up. Typewriters were replaced by computers pretty quickly. How many years did it take? I don't remember exactly how many years it took, but my guess is, CK, have you ever actually used a typewriter? Only as like a relic. Just to like play with it, like in a museum. Exactly, exactly. I, I wrote my college applications on typewriters, so I'm a lot older than CK. But CK is like in his mid-20s. I'm guessing, depending on your age, you uh, probably never used a typewriter. But if you're closer to my age, you remember this very well. Slide rules. Actually, slide rules are before my time. Kids in math class, chemistry class, they use slide rules all the time. Calculators came around and, and slide rules disappeared pretty quickly. People stopped using them. A big one was film to digital pictures. Uh, I remember having arguments with people saying how people are going to use digital pictures instead of film. You ever use a camera with film, CK? I did use a camera with film and actually recently had a disposable, but it's such a pain in the ass to like go get it developed when you're just used to you know, immediately having it as a digital form. Cameras with film, namely Polaroids, actually do have one use. You can take a photograph of your seed because you don't want your seed to be, uh, to be on a, a digital camera because it, it touches the internet. But uh, That's true. It, it's air-gapped. It, <laughs> your Polaroid is air-gapped. Landlines, most of us probably remember landlines, but still have landlines. I actually have a landline. Do you, do you have a landline, CK? I do not have a landline, but I think we get the point. <laughs> you got it. Technology changes. I also say in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. And, and, and I, I think that uh, it, it, it's, it's hard for people to understand how quickly these things can take place. I see a lot of what happens as being directly related to technology. And so many years ago, we used gold and precious metals as the only money. And gold and precious metals had certain significant drawbacks. Gold necessarily centralizes because it has a fundamental security flaw. It's heavy and it's hard to carry around. And you can't do business with gold except essentially face-to-face. -face. So what did we do? We created banks. And then what we further did so that we could extend the ability of, oh, the second problem gold has, by the way, is extensibility. It's very difficult to conduct small transactions with gold. So Banks were established, and I think some of the first banks were during the Italian Renaissance, uh, I want to say 1400s. And, and I, I would argue that banks were sort of a technological solution to the problems that existed with precious metals. So once you had banks, what you could do is you could deposit your gold with that bank, and that banker could then say, Mr. So-and-so is good for, good for this money, and you could conduct business more easily. And so, so I, I, I see what evolved from our financial system, what we live with in our financial system today, as being technological answers to problems that existed. Double entry bookkeeping was actually a huge advance in uh, 1400s in Italy. And that was a, a very big advance. It, it came around the same time as banking. That was an enormous advance in terms of the technology available at the time. And we don't necessarily think of double entry bookkeeping as a technology, but it really was an enormous benefit to the development of business. Uh, later on, we see changes in technology as it affected Wall Street. 
Um, there was a time when most stocks were held in paper form as certificates. And in fact, in 1968, uh, I'm pretty sure it was on Wednesdays, the stock market actually had to close on Wednesdays because there was so much backlog with um, the nature of, of the stock trading system that the clerks couldn't keep up with it. And there were a lot of changes that took place and others have described that better than me about the changes that took place uh, where the ownership of your stock, you, you actually don't own your own stock. The stock you hold is held in your name for you, but it's actually held by other corporations. You, you don't actually own the stock that, that they say is yours. You don't have legal title to it. You don't have the certificate in your hand. Well, it's more than just that. I, I, I'm trying to remember who I was listening to the other day who actually described this very well. And he described it in kind of depth that I'm, that I'm not easily able to describe it. But your stock certificate is held by corporations like uh, the DTC. And so you're a beneficial owner of the stock. You're actually not an owner. Your ownership is actually several layers removed from you. Um, but these were technological solutions to problems that existed in order to make stock investing and trading a smoother process. Um, Elizabeth Stark had commented that Lightning will disintermediate the financial system as we know it today. Lightning is a scaling layer of, uh, of Bitcoin. Money is a really hard topic. Money is so much a part of who we are that we don't think about that. We actually don't think much about the money we use. Now, people say, I use money all the time. I mean, why do I need to think about it? But there are certain simple machines that we use all the time that we actually don't think about either. And I, I would argue, and not just me, but Nick Zabo basically made this argument in his paper called Shelling Out, that money is, is, is intrinsic to humans' existence. And more than that is actually necessary for human scaling socially. And he writes this paper about the origins of money, which I want to read from a little bit, some, some, some things that... Uh, have become so much a part of us that we don't even think about it. Things like simple machines, like the wheel. The wheel's a very simple machine. We use it all the time, but we never think about it. Pulleys, the wheel and axle, pulleys, levers, screws, wedges, the inclined plane. Money is as core as these things. It's core to our human existence. Nick Zavo in his paper, Shelling Out, talks about the native he starts off his paper talking about the article talking about uh, native americans and their use of wampum as money when europeans came to the americas in the 1600s they hadn't been used to that kind of money but they quickly adopted to it and in fact once the europeans had gotten over their hang up of what constituted money the colonists went wild trading for and with wampum wampum was made of clams and clams entered the American vernacular as a way to save money. The Dutch governor of New Amsterdam took out a large loan from an English-American bank in wampum. And while British authorities were forced to go along, so wampum became pretty much legal tender in the, in the New England colonies from 1637 to 1661. But we're left with that in our language today. Now, I don't know. I'm not sure if guys your age actually heard this term. It was very common for say, you know, you got a hundred clams, you got 50 clams. In the beginning, and shelling out came to mean paying somebody in coins or bills, you're going to shell out your credit card to pay that restaurant bill. But that's an idea of how deep these things go in our history. And we don't, they become part of our language, they become part of who we are. And we don't really, we don't really separate those things out from what we see and live every day. It's a paper that everybody should read, and I can't do it justice here. I like to ask people a very simple question to demonstrate to them that they already know that the money that we use today is fundamentally flawed. And that question is a very simple question. So if you had a significant sum of money to you, now what that significant sum is different for everybody. If you're very rich, the significant sum might be a million, 10 million, a hundred million dollars. If you're a younger person, that might be $10,000. But all that matters is what's significant to you. If you had to hold that money for 20 years and you had to hold only that, that value in something for 20 years, and I gave you a choice of four different things, which one would you not choose? 
So you could have cash and that could be invested in treasury bills or money markets or a bank deposit. It could be gold. It could be a basket of stocks like the S&P. Or it could be real estate. Let's make it better. Instead of buying a piece of real estate, you could buy the equivalent of a basket of real estate. And most people would answer the one thing they would not want to own for 20 years if that was the only thing they could own is cash. Now, why is that? Because we don't know how the other things will do. We're pretty certain that if we hold a a cash or a cash-like instrument for a very long period of time, that that cash is going to become worth less over time. If you're a really talented investor, I know people who are extremely great at investing. They're able to construct stock portfolios with both long and short positions. And that can give you a very robust position of your wealth holdings that isn't terribly affected by severe downtimes and can make money for you on the, on the upturn. But that's, that's actually very hard to do. And very few people actually have that skill. So there are a lot of people who are interested in investing, but they also want to hold some of their money in cash or in money. Money ought to be the riskless asset. It ought to be the thing that you can hold for a long period of time without having to do something with it, without having to spend it on something, on a consumption item, without having to make it in an investment like real estate, like stocks, like art. Money ultimately gives us optionality. And so there may be times when you don't want to make an investment. You actually just want to hold your money in something which is a riskless asset, but that doesn't deteriorate over time. And the money that we have isn't that, because we know that over a long enough time horizon, it it declines in value. So if we ask what money is, money is a good, money is a present good, and it's half of every transaction. We don't think of it like this, but When you're buying something, you're actually selling somebody your money. I'm sure most people have never thought about that, that the person you're buying something from is actually buying your money. They're trading a good for your money. They are. They're trading a good for your money. And and, and just to refer back to money is not just a good, but it's also a tool. And a lot of people have said that, that money is a belief system. Money is actually not a belief system. Money's a tool with certain qualities to it. Money is not a shared hallucination. It's not something we all get together and we all say, oh, well, we agree that this is money. That's actually not how it happens. Even if we took a simple example of cigarettes in a prison, it had certain practical means to be used as a money. And I don't want to go too deeply down that hole because I'm, I'm, I'm not about trying to make that as an explanation. So the best money is a good which has qualities that are recognized by more and more people over time. And the recognition of those qualities becomes what some might refer to as a shelling point. I think of it a little bit differently. I think of it as more like a path which can become a highway. So if you look at some roads that we have in the United States, maybe elsewhere as well, I think many of these roads started off as paths that people took. And then over time, they became more commonplace and used more widely by people and became highways. And that's in a lot of ways what we've seen in our financial system. Many have a hard time coming to terms with the idea that money is of being a good. It doesn't need to be physical. It must be identifiable. And they have a hard time coming to terms with the idea that it's a good that people recognize the qualities of. And I came up with a little example that I think helps to explain that. This is the idea that money is not a belief system, but is a good which has certain qualities. The example is that of a workman's ladder. So what are the qualities which might cause one workman, might cause a workman to choose one ladder versus another? You might look at its height, its weight, its strength, its construction, its design, the materials that determine what the attributes are. And then a workman chooses a ladder based on those qualities. If a thousand workmen all choose the same ladder, they didn't arrive at that choice by a social consensus. They arrived at that choice based on the qualities of what that ladder is. We don't, we don't think of money this way. And part of the reason why we don't think of money like this is that thinking of money as a good is that for so much of our existence, money has just been given to us. We, I don't literally mean that somebody gave you money, but they've dictated the money that we use. And so we don't see the process of of how money became money, but money has certain qualities as a good. So the example that I'm using is a workman's ladder. And 
workmen don't all agree on the kind of ladder that they want to use. They look at the qualities of what makes a good ladder and they choose a ladder based on that. So for a ladder, they might look at height, weight, strength, its construction, its design, its materials that it's made out of, and then examine those attributes and decide what they want to use. So for instance, if they have to lot of lift if they have to lift a lot of heavy weights on the things that they do, they could potentially pick a ladder which weighed several hundred pounds, but then that wouldn't be a ladder they could easily move from job to job. If a thousand workmen were to choose one ladder versus another, did they arrive at those choices by a social consensus? And they, they didn't arrive at it by a social consensus. They arrived at it based on their own observations and judgments for what they needed and then chose that ladder. Most workmen have six and eight foot ladders that they bring to jobs that are typically of a certain type of construction. But there was no decision-making process of getting together with unions of people describing what, what ladder we're going to use. They just chose ladders that made sense for them. Money's a good like a ladder is good, but it doesn't have to be physical. Its value is determined by its qualities. And money is also a tool, and it's a very simple tool. As I was saying earlier, it's so much a part of us that we don't actually think about it, just like we don't think about the wheels on our car unless we get a flat tire, and we think about the wheels a lot. So what are the qualities that makes the best money in the world? It would be scarce, limited in supply, excessive production makes money less valuable. So, and it also must be impossible to replicate, can't be counterfeited. Fungible, essentially indistinguishable from the rest of its kind. Gold coins are an example of that. They're pretty much fungible. It's not consumable. It doesn't get used up as it's being used for money. So it can be reused over and over again. It's portable, highly divisible, easy to secure, inexpensively securable, easily transactable, transactable at a distance. Bitcoin can be used over the internet, over, over a communications line. Uh, we need a trusted third party to enable us to engage in transaction. We could use our credit cards on the internet. You can use your Visa, you could use your MasterCard, your American Express card, your Discover card, but you're relying on that banker to make the transaction for you. With Bitcoin, it's much more like a cash transaction where you're able to make that transaction yourself the way you make a cash transaction. And lastly, it has transaction finality, uh, like cash. When I hand you cash, it's yours and it's no longer my cash. Pretty much the transaction's final. I think that over time, everyone will end up buying Bitcoin because of its outstanding qualities. And the more people come to understand this, the more they're going to want to hold it. To me, it's one of the most conservative investments, if not the most conservative investment in the world today, because its qualities are so superior to that of golds that it should at least be equal to gold. Today, Bitcoin is in the range of $7,500, $7,600. And I could see it easily going up to between four dollars and $500,000 in the next decade. I tend to think that there are four different types of people who do or don't think about Bitcoin. And each of these people will pay successfully higher prices. There are people who don't know about it, the uninformed, and it's hard to know what price the uninformed will pay. Skeptics, cynics, and haters. And I think that skeptics will overcome their objections first, then will the cynics, then will the haters. And the haters will end up paying the highest price. When I look at Bitcoin, Trace Mayer described what he said as the seven network effects. Money is actually the biggest network that we have. We don't, we don't think about it like that. We don't think about money as being a network. The US dollar is used widely all around the world. There's a, an enormous network of users of the dollar. I've often heard some critics say that one cryptocurrency, one version of Bitcoin is equal to another version of Bitcoin. And I would argue fairly strongly that that's not actually the case. With base protocol, Bitcoin itself, and scaling layers that get developed, things like Lightning and other types of scaling layers that get developed, Bitcoin attracts its own series of network effects. And as long as <clears throat> the cost of transaction doesn't become enormously high for an extended period of time, uh, and, and that's what the scaling layers give us the advantage of, that people will, cho will, will choose the best network effects. Those network effects, as, as Trace Mayer described, are speculation, merchant adoption, consumer adoption, security, which are the miners, developers have an affinity for working on certain projects, financialization, and then as a settlement currency. 
and ultimately being adopted as world's one and only money. I see this as being an iterative process. These things, one affects the other. It's not an either or. It, it, it's a process that as the price goes up, draws in more network effects and the price fluctuates. You might drive some holders of it out, uh, but the people who understand it best Trace Mayer calls the hodlers of last resort. And those are the people who are going to want to hold Bitcoin um, and look opportunistically to buy it and own it at its cheapest price. And these people are often very long-term oriented in their, uh, in their views. The hodlers are the backbone. The hodlers are the backbone. And as, as, as CK says, we, hyper-Bitcoinization is happening now. You'll hear people say the, the, first, the first comment they make is, oh, the government is going to stop the use of Bitcoin. And the government certainly can be a little bit of an impediment. Um, they can make it difficult to purchase Bitcoin. But there are pluses and minuses with, with, with thinking about it from that perspective, because as a new technology, when the internet first came around, there were those who opposed the internet. Laws were passed to make it easier to conduct transactions and, and, and use the internet. It became more business friendly. If the United States and other countries were to adopt policies that are unfriendly to Bitcoin, I think you're going to find in the longer run that those countries are going to end up not well positioned in the advent of a new technology and will be disadvantaged. The disintermediation that Bitcoin has on the financial system will happen regardless of uh, whether those countries actively oppose it. Certain similar simple examples, drugs are illegal in many places. Drugs are still pretty easy to get, even though they're illegal and the government tries to stop drugs. Never been easier, especially with Bitcoin. It's just anecdotal. It's just- But we know it's true. Tor plus know. Bitcoin, like, we, they we just do, send it in the mail. We do, we do know it's true. So I'll, le- I'll leave you with this. This was a Satoshi writing. As a thought experiment, imagine there was a base metal as scarce as gold, but with the following properties. It was a boring gray in color. It was not a good conductor of electricity. It was not particularly strong, was not ductile, or easily malleable either. It was not useful for any practical or ornamental purpose, but it had one special magical property. It could be transported over a communications channel. If it somehow acquired any value at all, for whatever reason, then anyone wanting to transfer wealth over a long distance could buy some, transmit it, and have the recipient sell it. Maybe it could get an initial value circularly, as you've suggested by people, foreseeing its potential, usefulness, and exchange. I would definitely want some. Maybe collectors, any random reason could spark it. Satoshi Nakawa said, I would definitely want some. And I agree with him. I think the idea of Bitcoin as being gold 2.0, digital gold. Payment technology is still in relatively early stages, the Lightning Network and other scaling layers. But its value as a scarce item, an item which you can hold, easily secure, transmit value with, even if you're only transmitting value to your future self. And Saifedean Amos, who wrote the Bitcoin Standard, talks about the idea that the most important trades that we do are the trades we do with our future selves. Nick Szabo's paper on shelling out talks of similar types of trades. They might not have been frequent trades that people did or that communities did, but passing wealth along to a future generation or just passing wealth along to your future self. So in the next decade, even if, even if Bitcoin were not useful in buying coffee, there's more than enough opportunity to transact to buy some for yourself. And as other people come to recognize the qualities that Bitcoin has, just sell off little pieces of it as its value goes up in these trades with your future self. And I think that's something that's very hard for people to come to terms with. Lately, one of the things that I've seen has become a common topic of FUD. What does that stand for again? FUD? Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. People talk about adoption rate. They compare Bitcoin's adoption rate with the number of users Bitcoin has. We don't actually know the number of users. It's, it's actually very hard to know how you know, if somebody has... $10 worth of Bitcoin. Are they a user? Are they not a user? $100 worth? You know, at what point do you define somebody as a user? And you're also using addresses as a proxy in some degree. Which is, which is, a, which is a false notion. 
that can't be counted. But what we do know about Bitcoin is we know what its market cap is. And so comparing Bitcoin as a money, as a store of value for your future self, and we can get into the ideas later on about it being useful to buy and sell things on a regular basis. But just as a transaction you're going to engage in with yourself, comparing it to a game that's free to download, comparing it to other things which are free, as Nassim Taleb says, you don't have skin in the game with those things. People who take their value and they put it into Bitcoin are, are voting with their own personal skin in the game. As people come to understand that Bitcoin is money you can hold outside of the financial system. It's money that you can control yourself if you control your private keys. It's money that essentially cannot be taken from you. Now, there could be what they call wrench attacks. So somebody could say, give me your Bitcoin. But if you don't give it to them, they can't get it. We understand that there, there are difficulties with that. But And I hate to go on a tangent here, but as the nature of its security gets easier, we already have something called multi-sig which is a multi-signature wallet. We can store those keys in various locations. Things like wrench attacks become much more difficult. You have a key which is stored in your bank vault. You have a key which is stored with your lawyer. You have a key which is stored in your house. You might have a key which is stored with a friend or a parent or somebody else. So those wrench attacks become much harder to do. The example I like to give is uh, many years ago when people were breaking into car windows in New York, uh, still in the radio, the, the radio manufacturers made those car radios one-to-one -one correspondence with the car. Those car radios couldn't be used with other cars. So it became, the value of the, of, of the radio dropped. It, it basically had no value and, and, and those, those crimes pretty much stopped. But as people come to understand what, what Bitcoin's properties are, they're going to want to own some. And how much you should own is a debatable point. And I'm not here to tell anybody how much Bitcoin they should own or not own. But it's an enormously asymmetrical bet on other people recognizing the quality and value of what this money is. And those people who have bought it already have come to understand exactly what Bitcoin is. And they have skin in the game. Unlike the free downloads that you might have for, uh, for your game. And in 10 years, it's had a value which is ranged as high as $300 billion. Today, it's in the neighborhood of uh, $140 billion, which is pretty substantial. And I think you'll see this thing at numbers, as I said, in the next decade that are unimaginable. I think most people can't imagine half a million dollars in 10 years. I guess it'll be a lot higher than that. This was awesome as an introduction to this. And honestly, some of my favorite parts is just really trying to hone in on money is a good and not this thing that we agree on. We agree on it because the properties are, it's undeniable. Like this is the best thing to use for the function of money and storing value. So that I think is really key here. Um, I love the stories and I love the examples, really making it easy to understand why Bitcoin has this potential. The next three episodes are going to be covering and building on what we started here the first is kind of how to think about Bitcoin and value it as a store of value. The third episode in the series is going to be more focused about how to think about investing in Bitcoin and how to position yourself for, you know, minimum pain and maximum and maximum gain. And lastly, we're going to talk about the path to 100 trillion USD repricing the world in Satoshi's hyper Bitcoinization, really what we think is the end game for Bitcoin. I'm super, super excited to continue to create this, uh, this series and do it with you, Tina. All right, guys, you're going to be able to find this podcast at Bitcoin Magazine. So if you just go in your podcast player and look up the Bitcoin Magazine feed, you'll be able to find it there. We're going to be tweeting about it at Bitcoin Magazine. And I know Bitcoin Tina is going to be tweeting about this alongside a lot of other signal at Bitcoin Tina. Thank you for listening. Tune in next week. A quick reminder that all of the content in this episode is for informational and entertainment purposes only. You should not construe the information as legal, tax, investment, financial, or any other advice. 
Nothing contained in this presentation constitutes a solicitation, recommendation, or offer by BTC Media, the Let's Talk Bitcoin Podcast Network, or any third-party service provider to buy or sell securities or any other financial instruments. Do your own research.